Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so today we are delighted to have with us Professor Margarita Klee. Uh, she is an assistant professor at uh, ETH Zurich, leading the Vision for Robotics lab there. Uh, she is also the vice director of the Institute of Robotics and Intelligent Systems of ETH Zurich and an honorary fellow at the University of Edinburgh, UK. Uh, she has held prestig the prestigious Chancellor's Fellowship of the University of Edinburgh, as well as the highly competitive Swiss National Science Foundation Professorship. Her research interest is in computer vision for robotics, with her group looking at various aspects of robotic perception, in particular focusing on real-time perception with small unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, her contributions to the development of robotic vision have been recognized at several venues, such as the Zonta Prize, Reuters, World Economic Forum in Davos, and RoboHub's list of 25 women in robotics you need to know about. Uh, today, she will be talking to us about her work on SLAM and beyond, advancing vision-based robotic perception. And with that, uh, I hand it over to you, uh, Margarita. Great, thank you very much, Paloma. Thank you very much, Nikhil, and the rest of the team for the invitation. This is um, an amazing uh, SLAM series for, um, well, SLAM uh, discussion and SLAM talks. So um, hence my title, SLAM and beyond, advancing vision-based robotic perception. Now, um, I wanted to show you two videos um, that, uh, yeah, here we go, uh, where you can see this flock of starlings that they're moving in space in seemingly perfect unison uh, without crashing into each other and creating these beautiful formations. Um, so the question where I'm going with this is, what level of skill and situational awareness do we need to build into our robots in order to have them navigate so seamlessly in, in our world around us and interact with each other, with us, with our world around us? So I've taken this huge question and I've broken it down into three distinct challenges, three naive and distinct challenges that I think we ought to address. So first of all, we need to have high fidelity ego motion and scene estimation, which is bound to give our robots a sense of space, where they are in space, how they move in it, and what does that space look like? And then go a level further in intelligence, if you'd like, to have some richer scene representations um, in order for our robots to be able to interact with their scenes and actually perform some autonomous task for example, to fly from A to B, or even to uh, plan a grasping motion um, through space. And then when you imagine that you have robots that they're able to address challenges one and two, um, then how about um, assuming that you have multiple robots in the area um, that they're tasked to do the same mission? And how can we have them collaborating effectively with each other? For example, to, to build a common map of the scene or to transport the load of um, one object that one by, by themselves cannot transport. Now, these three challenges represent the three main research streams in my lab. And I'm gonna go through them, explain a little bit what I mean again uh, by each of them and give you a taste of some of the works that we do to address them. Uh, let me clarify already that we haven't really solved any of these uh, questions. They're very much open questions. Um, so what I'm going to show are approaches to addressing parts of these questions. So, and as you know, every approach has uh, strengths and weaknesses. So your task is to figure that out. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So um, let's start with the first challenge, high fidelity ego motion and scene estimation. And of course, what I really mean here is high fidelity SLAM. Now in this crowd, I don't really need to give a definition of what SLAM is, the acronym, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, but um, I think it is important to um, talk a little bit about the problem. So whenever I, um, I give this uh, SLAM lecture to my students uh, and I ask them what do they think SLAM is doing, they manage to come up with the first bit of this question, so how to track the motion of the robot while it is moving, but usually they miss out the next two parts in an unknown environment and using onboard sensors, right? 
So looking at this video here, we humans are pretty good at understanding how the camera has been moving in order to capture a video like this. But the way that we, you, we do this in traditional vision-based slam is that we're picking natural scene features, these patches that you see on the left, and we observe their motion, how they move from one frame to the next. And we start reasoning about how the camera has been moving in order to capture them. And on the right hand side, you can see an EKF map there of these features placed in relation to each other and in, in relation to the camera pose. That's why you see these blobs there um, and that they're ever expanding, right? Because we're moving away from the starting position. Now, this is an old video, it's back from my PhD, is ancient times already. But um, fast forward a few years down the line, um, this was uh, during my postdoc time here at ETH Zurich, where I got to work on this project to um, automate the navigation of a small aircraft. And indeed, what you're looking at is um, the result of uh, a few years of work to make this happen. So we have a small drone that is equipped with one camera and one inertial measurement unit. and. Um, we were able to show for the first time that it is possible to automate the flight of a small aircraft like this with these sensors, right? So you can see the, um, the type of features that we're tracking. So we're using PTAM in the background for those who, who know, but um, also uh, using some tricks with um, GPS for initialization of the system. And of course, some inertial information as well. Right, now, um, I didn't want to talk about this, but I, I need to say this, that whenever you see a video like this, you need to know that there is quite a few um, days in advance that we needed to go on site to calibrate our cameras, make sure that connections work well. Um, and on the day, of course, we're very dependent on how strong the sunlight is and everything. So when you're seeing one autonomous flight, of course, there's a lot of manual work behind it as well. Which brings me also to my next point, when uh, so here you're looking at a video a more recent one um now my student is walking down a pedestrian street here in zurich she's holding a visual inertial sensor and she's running visual inertial slam actually in this case it's Ocvis using brisk features and uh, at the time that was the the leader um in the literature so you can see the red uh, trajectory being estimated the yellow and orange points being estimated so this is a straight street she walks down one side and comes back the other side and of course the what you are observing there is the drift so these two locations should have corresponded to exactly the same place. So what has happened is that during the course of time, um, errors have accumulated in the system, which result in drift. And no matter how brilliant your SLAM system is, if it's not using a global positioning um, system or global measurement of some sort, um, then it's bound to drift. Good slam systems um, drift slowly, okay, but they always drift. So in cases like this, um, it is well. It, this is a well-known problem in the literature. This is the place recognition problem, and in cases like this, when we want to recognize when a robot is coming back to a location where it has been to before. <coughs> Sorry, then we are um, using analogies from uh, Google Images, basically, and, and Google um, Text Retrieval to build a vocabulary of visual words and search for matching images in this database of images that the robot has captured throughout its trajectory. Right? I'm sure some of, it, some of you have heard of this before. Um, but just to show you a few of the problems that we have in place recognition um, for, for vision based SLAM. Um, well, different places can appear to look the same. The same place can appear to look very different or a little different um, between visits and very different when you consider the, the change in seasons and the change in um, illumination, so day and night changes. So you all know that these correspond to this. Well, we all know when you look closely, you can see that these places correspond to the same location, but you can see that the visual appearance has changed a lot. And um, as if this was not enough, when you're experiencing the scene with a the drone, then you also have to take into account the problem of viewpoint changes. So um, this is the same place viewed from very different viewpoints. How can I make my system recognize that I'm coming back to the same location? And let me focus a little bit on this challenge um, 
in particular. Right, so we're saying, um, so this is work that um, uh, Fabiola and Lucas have um, developed in my lab. Um, and they said, we're anyway running SLAM on board our robots, um, probably visual inertial SLAM. Let's, let's assume visual inertial SLAM in this case. And we know that in traditional place recognition, we are um, uh, holding appearance checks, checking the current image with respect to an image database to see whether the current image ma matches the visual features of what we've experienced in the past. Um, but since we are running SLAM anyway, why not also store a local 3D map of that location as um, a geometric signature of what the, that location looks like. And what does that mean? That means once you run your appearance checks, then you can run also geometric checks to filter out any um, false positives that you get out of the appearance match. So here we are running um, three-dimensional and two-dimensional um, appearance checks from 3D to 2D and from 3D to 3D, uh, basically to, to match the current view with respect to potential matches from the database. And here you can see the system in action. We're going back to the same place a few months later, actually, and you can see the trajectory here in blue. And we are able to uh, recover a lot of loops. Here you can uh, visualize them in green, but you can see that some of them, some of the loops we were not, we were not able to recognize. Why? Because uh, when, when Fabiola was labeling this, um, uh, the, the data set, she was telling me it's actually so hard for the system to recognize this because the, the stores have changed their displays. Right, we've gone from I don't know the summer collection to the winter collection, and some stores have even even changed their logos. So these are uh, it comes to show you um, the whole um, pipeline of um, suppression of information that we do as humans when we are recognizing whether we are in the same place or not. Right. Right. Um, but nevertheless, we had some good results in viewpoint tolerance, but we wanted to push this a little bit further for wide baseline place recognition. So we actually thought, you know, we want to have up to from zero to all the way up to 45 degrees, as you see um, here, as I define 45 degrees here from, from the horizon, right? Um, so we know that current systems were not able to perform uh, uh, at this level of um, uh, baseline changes. And the way to test this would only be a simulation because then we would have the ground truth on what really is uh, uh, the correct viewpoint change and and the overlap of the scene from uh, scene zero to scene uh, 45 degrees. So um, how we did that, we've taken the system that we had before, but in order to augment the tolerance for viewpoints, then um, Fabiola and Lucas came up with this idea of doing local map densification to come up with a local uh, mesh, three-dimensional mesh of the structure that we are interested in, in order to enhance the geometric checks that we are doing, because that's exactly what is breaking, right? So the planarity assumption that we usually make by looking at 2D features, right? Um, yes, it's a little bit um, changed when you're looking at the 3D structure of your sparse features, but they're still sparse. So, so some local map densification um, has proven to be very, very helpful. And here you are looking at some uh, examples. First of all, at this planar scene, the Lagu photogrammetric uh, data set, we are matching um, the new um, blue um, uh, trajectory against the reference red trajectory. You can see on the top the two images from zero to 45 degrees and have a look at how different they actually look. Um, and it's on purpose that they're in black and white and a little bit degraded because we want to simulate the kind of images that we get from our sensor on board. Uh, here you're looking at a, um, a more three dimensional scene where viewpoint tolerance can actually uh, is really challenged, but we have shown that we achieve better recall for perfect precision with respect to the state of the art. Um, right. Now, when we are talking about um, seasonal illumination and situation um, changes, then um, not only my lab, but also in general in the literature, I think it's fair to say that we resort to deep learning, right? And here you are looking at a system that has been trained um, 
on webcam data from June and from February. So this web, these webcams have been looking at the same locations um, in, in February and in June. And then we fed these uh, images into a convolutional neural network that was able to not only understand how one image is different from one location, captures images that are different from the other images, but also it was able to suppress transient changes in the scene that are uh, coming, for example, due to illumination or weather changes, as you've seen. Uh, for me, the most spectacular ones are the ones with the snow, where we have on one side the snow here and on the other side the grass. And you can see that the system is able to recover um, the correct return for that query. Uh, which is a little bit of a magic, but I have to say it doesn't work always. Of course, it has its limitations, and we can talk about them later if you'd like. Um, but uh, just to hint a little bit, it has to do with, the, of course, the viewpoint here. Oh, the viewpoint is really um, um, looking upright, right? No viewpoint changes here. The, the sky is always on the top. And of course, it really depends on what kind of data you're training um, your, your um, framework with. Right, so for high fidelity SLAM, I've shown you quite a few uh, works. So we've been experimenting with different sensors. I didn't really talk about this, but we do work with different sensors. Well, when I say vision, we mean it in a very loose um, term. So we, we work with event-based cameras, with depth cameras, with uh, LiDAR, uh, but yes, of course, primarily with the traditional visible light um, sensing. And then, of course, with sensor fusion, with deep learning, with place recognition. Why? Because we want to form this backbone of the awareness of space for a robot, right? To give it a sense of its pose and a sense of the map of these surroundings. And the key word here is that this map so far has been largely sparse, right? Which brings me to the second challenge. So we would like now to... Um, built in some more intelligence in our robots to come with richer scene representations. Why? Because when you have a point cloud as your scene representation, if you reach out to grasp an object and in between your points, there's nothing in your point cloud, you don't know if it's free space and you're not going to crash into it and you don't know um, Sorry, you don't know if there is a wall and you're going to crash into it, or you don't know if it's free space and you can actually navigate through. So that's why we want scene reconstruction for interaction and path planning to reach out and grasp objects or to avoid obstacles while flying. And uh, now you're looking at an example. We have a, a drone that is using one camera on board. And um, we have gone to this area before with a, with a tripod and captured a laser scan of the scene. Here you're looking at that laser scan in red. This red laser scan is serving as our, um, our ground truth. We are using a sparse input, sparse depth input, for example, coming from SLAM, from point-based uh, point SLAM. And then we are augmenting this depth information uh, using a trained network to come up not only with a, a, a more complete depth estimate, but also with a confidence uh, value on how confident we are in each um, depth value. So you can see, for example, that as, um, as look because is, is bringing this, this reconstruction from a top view. You can see that through windows, we're not doing that well. Of course, this is a problem of vision, right? But this is where I would expect my confidence to be low or around the staircase. You can see that it's a little bit fuzzy and that's also places where the, uh, the confidence of your depth is, is not really very good. But this is very useful because um, in obstacle avoidance, you don't necessarily need to have a very, very accurate 3D reconstruction, right? Uh, maybe you do when you're doing a monitoring of archaeological sites but when you want to avoid obstacles you want to maintain a certain safe distance right maybe one or two meters away from your structure depending on what it is that you'd like to do so having access to this confidence is important now with um, uh, dense reconstructions like this um, we can enable some autonomy and here you can see it now in action. So this is a video um, captured from this summer, actually. Um, we have now a drone that is using a gimbal actuated camera and uh, it's tasked, so it takes off and knows nothing about the scene. And it, it is tasked with um, coming up with the reconstruction of the scene that it is looking at. Bear in mind that these two videos are not actually synchronized. 
Um, but um, what you're looking at is here, the, the, um, uh, the drone is not piloted, but it's uh, programmed to explore uh, this space in order to optimize for the best coverage of this um, scene of rubble. And um, the red, green, blue, uh, not blue, red, green, yellow um, squares that you see here, here are the evaluated viewpoints uh, in the vicinity, local vicinity of the drone. And these are ranked according to the expected information gain um, that um, they are estimated to provide us with respect to completing this, um, this scene reconstruction. And um, let me show you a little bit here about, um, on the inside about how this works, and I will let Eve explain this better than I do. We present a path pattern for 3D reconstruction of large scenes for an MAV equipped with a gimbal actuated camera. Potential next best views are sampled from the MAV's configuration space and ranked by their expected information gain. The information gain of a proposed viewpoint is calculated with the ray casting operation and encodes visibility of frontiers, visibility of unknown space, as well as quality improvements of the reconstructed surface. In this more intricate bridge scene, the actuated gimbal seems to be necessary to fully reconstruct the scene. Without the gimbal, the underside of the bridge is not fully absorbable, leading to gaps in the mesh. Our planners also perform well in large indoor scenes. Not only is our approach faster, but once again, some surfaces are only observable with the actuated gimbal. So this was just uh, presented at um, IROS and um, we could show that with the system we have very good um, coverage and very good uh, reconstruction quality with respect to the state of the art. Um, and maybe one more work that was presented at IROS just now is um, uh, Luca Bartolomei's work on semantic aware active perception for UAVs using deep reinforcement learning, where our goal here is to plan a path for a drone like this um, to navigate through space um, in order to minimize the estimation errors in the visual odometry. So yes, of course, this can come at the cost of a bit of a longer um, trajectory, but the aim is that we want to avoid any areas in the scene that are um, bottlenecks for our visual odometry. For example, whoever has worked with water knows that water is um, uh, and not the best um, area to, to look at when you want to, to navigate, right? When you want to perform slam. Or how about moving trees or um, cars, right? So having access to such semantic labels and putting these in our um, uh, optimization function of how we generate this path then um, is bound to lead to more robust and realistically applicable uh, uh, paths. And just to say a few words here about the uh, deep policy training, we are um, maximizing the reward in an episode based fashion. And here we're using as a reward, we're using a mixture of these three components. First of all, we are interested in the survival of the visual odometry. So we're trying to keep uh, in the field of view um, as many landmarks as we can. And then we also want to minimize the root mean square error. Uh, of, of the trajectory as a whole. And also um, <clears throat> we are penalizing um, any progress to the goal that is not fast enough, okay? So we're using these three rewards to come up with this. And now I'm gonna show you some uh, results that we have um, in these examples. So you're gonna see, I think it's two examples, is on photorealistic um, simulations that we came uh, gave up actually, it's, it's a real life. So here you're looking at the real life um, view of the scene. And as soon as I start the video, you're gonna look at the, um, uh, the reconstructed view. Um, here it is. Now we are um, comparing against 
uh, three different planners. On the top, the top two planners have no semantics encoded in them. Um, so the first of all, the first uh, top left uh, is doing a lot of detours. It's using um, active perception to maximize the uh, the number of landmarks that are visible, but it's not really using semantics to guide this robot um, uh, towards the goal with uh, taking into account really how good the uh, root mean square error of that trajectory is. On the right hand side, top right, there's uh, no perception that is taken into account. So this is a reactive planner that is um, trying to reach the goal as fast as possible. On the bottom left, we do have semantics. So this is our previous work. But in this case, semantics were um, basically having a um, binary weight, right, a zero or a one. Uh, of being a safe or unsafe space to navigate through or navigate on top, actually. And on this new work uh, that you're seeing on the bottom right, we have uh, the best performance because we're actually adapting the relative weight of um, how uh, good or bad an area is to navigate on top of, right? Because sometimes when, when a road is very busy, it might be a good idea. Um, not to navigate on top of it, but if the road is empty, for example, then it doesn't mean that it's not it's uh, uh, not a good area to to use to localize from. Right, and with this, I'm coming now to the final challenge, the multi-agent robot collaboration. And in order to explain to you our contributions here, um, I want to zoom out a little bit and talk a bit about SLAM in general. So we're going now into the basics of SLAM, okay? So um, I'm gonna show you the graphical representation of SLAM. I'm sure some people have talked about this before, but again, I think it's always useful to to, to see how someone else is explaining it. And hopefully you get something and put the bits and pieces of your puzzle and come up with a, a very good view of what the SLAM problem is and what it's trying to do. So here we're having some 3D landmarks. Uh, I named them X. And uh, please consult this legend here on the bottom right, where I have this simplified room, right, where we have a robot, um, we have a few landmarks. This robot is equipped with a sensor, let's say a camera, and it's able to uh, view, experience these landmarks through this camera via images, right? So back to our graph structure, we have our 3D landmarks here as nodes X, and we have our camera poses that they are related. In this case, I'm assuming I'm having a ground robot and um, the camera poses are related with respect to the control inputs of how the robot has been moving, right? Move left or right, forward. And um, now how are these landmarks related to the camera poses? Well, they are related with the experiences of these landmarks through the images, right? So these 2D observations, these Zs that I have here. Uh, so you can see I have a lot more Zs than Xs because you can observe the same landmark from different viewpoints, right? Now, how do we go about solving this problem? Now, in the, we know that the best solution for, for SLAM is the full graph optimization, what we term as bundle adjustment. And it's uh, basically trying to estimate this posterior right here. So the way that we do this is that we marginalize out the, um, uh, the uh, variables that we know about, and then what, re what remains is direct constraints amongst the nodes that we, we are trying to figure out. And you can imagine that this is, instead of looking at lines, imagine them to be springs. So here I have a network of springs. Every pose and every landmark wants to pull and push their own way. But the full bundle adjustment is actually coming uh, up with a steady state of this network that you're looking here. So this is the best solution that one can have with this data, right? Um, to come up with a globally consistent solution. But of course, you can see that um, this is largely infeasible when we start adding more poses and more um, uh, features and landmarks and more observations. So for this reason, we're coming up with um, the filtering uh, approach to, to approximate this as you, you've seen in previous lectures, but also with a keyframe based approach that is uh, turning out to be quite a lot more popular these days, where actually what we're doing is that we are choosing to ignore some intermediate poses uh, 
and retain the most representative frames, the key frames. Now, what makes uh, a good keyframe is subject to um, research, I would say. Uh, so far, it's largely been um, uh, people resort to uh, uh, ad hoc um, uh, metrics to, for example, the visibility of, of uh, features, right? So let's not go into details of this uh, to remain on point. But the idea is that we want to estimate this posterior now. So we want to estimate all of the poses, camera poses, all of the landmarks when I know the uh, observations and the control input, right? And so we are optimizing now the, the resulting graph using non-linear optimization, and that scales much better with a number of features than the full problem that we've seen before. Right, now with this in mind, uh, let's look at how we can build collaborative SLAM. Uh, but first of all, some notation. So, um, Right, so imagine here that you have this drone and it's uh, building up um, a map of its environment, of its surroundings, right? And in the same way, uh, in the same map structure that I shown before, uh, here X is a three-dimensional vector and I reference it with respect to the world frame and J is uh, the Jth landmark. Right, I index it on the landmark. Now, uh, we also want to define the keyframe poses. Um, if you're not familiar, familiar with the Lee group, then don't worry too much about this. This is um, defined in SC3, but it's actually, it's um, a transformation. I define my keyframe pose to be a transformation with respect to the world frame, right? So um, I say that my keyframe is actually a, a new frame of reference and T is my um, transformation to that. It's a rotation matrix and a translation vector from the world to the ith keyframe. And the objective here is now I'm just putting in, in uh, an equation what I said uh, in words before. The objective here is to optimize uh, all the camera, all the landmarks and all the camera poses by minimizing the reprojection error of these landmarks with respect to all the matched key points, Z. Remember the Z that we've seen before. And so I have a projection function. Again, um, there are projection models for your favorite camera here that take a landmark and project it to the image of uh, this keyframe from this pose, and then it's subtracting it from the actual observation to come up with this reprojection error. And then the idea is that we want to minimize the sum of the Hubert loss function of the squared reprojection error that they are scaled with respect to the covariance matrix um, of where that key point was detected. Right. So now imagine that you have one robotic agent that is running Visual Slam and is doing all this local bundle adjustment all the time. Then imagine that you have more drones that do exactly the same thing. So to do collaborative Slam, what we do, we are saying, right, you know, I know that at some point you need to keep forgetting, you need to start forgetting about your past camera poses and your past experiences. So before you forget, just send all your data down to a central server, or if you'd like, um, uh, this could be the cloud as well. So basically this central server keeps a copy of all the experiences of each agent. Um, it's acting a bit like a bookkeeping entity. Now, um, because this is also, um, uh, um, it, it could be um, an entity that has a lot more computation then onboard the central server, we are running uh, more computationally expensive things. That's also what I replay what you've seen before here. This is the loop closure that um, in this case, I simulate to be detected between two, uh, two maps, right? So here we have seen two maps that, um, are merged with each other and we have new links inserted. And in such cases, we run optimization, global optimization on the central server. And then we can inform any participating agents about um, any uh, changes that have happened in uh, their local vicinity that would be re relevant to them, right? So again, we have multiple agents that we are assuming that they don't have a lot, more, a lot of computation, but they do have some computation on board. And we have a central server, which can be a standard desktop um, or laptop actually, uh, or the cloud that is doing all the um, map merging and, and global optimization before informing these agents. 
So let's look at these optimizations. What happens at place recognition instance? Right, before we go ahead and optimize the whole thing, um, it's a well-known strategy that it's good to do post-graph optimization first by um, uh, not taking into account the, um, uh, the features, the landmarks for the moment, and only taking into account these poses, right? To do post-graph optimization, to distribute the error along the graph that is introduced by this new link that I just added from my place recognition. So um, let's define uh, this SIJ, which is a similarity um, transformation. So um, which is basically a, a rigid body transformation as T is, but also has a seventh, um, a seventh dimension for scale, right? So this is the uh, similarity transformation between two closing keyframes. And now I'm defining this new error that it should again uh, um, sum up to one, which is this circular error, I call it, because we are multiplying all these errors that should accumulate to something that's close to zero or zero actually. And um, uh, again, don't be confused by this notation. This is a function that is transforming uh, my error to a, a seven dimensional um, space. So this is um, a seven dimensional vector, basically. So defining my errors like this, um, in order to do post graph optimization, we are minimizing this uh, Hubert loss function, the sum of this uh, Hubert loss function of the squared such circular errors that they are weighted with respect to the information matrix on this edge. And once we come up with the first error distribution on this post graph, then uh, we are running full global optimization, which is exactly what I've shown before, right? Now I'm taking into account the whole thing. So this is the full global bundle adjustment that I was talking about before and that's exactly the same um, um, minimization that I was doing in the slide before and let's look at this system in action so here you're looking at my server here is um, a standard laptop we have we have three drones and three pilots my drones here are non, not autonomous that means that the each pilot is piloting one drone and um, bear in mind that they take off they know nothing about each other they don't know how many there are uh, they don't know where they are so they start mapping their environment but of course we are navigating their paths in such a way that they experience overlap. And you've seen that progressively, these maps have been merged um, inside the server um, and optimized such that then all these three drones operate within this map. So where does the collaboration come in? Well, once these um, drones start to uh, navigate in the same map, they actually exchange information about their scene. So one drone can navigate to a place where someone else has uh, been to before. So it doesn't need to run slam from scratch, but it's actually doing localization of um, uh, a known map then, right? And so here we are running loop closure, not only within um, the trajectory of one drone, but also multiple drones to, to have to experience this overlap. And it's important to say here that um, in the best case scenario, communication works well, and we have um, a well collaborating and communicating team of drones. But in the worst case scenario where our Wi-Fi doesn't really work, then this um, reduces into a system where it's a sum of its parts, okay? So it's really uh, three drones performing SLAM independently, individually, uh, and with a more um, limited time horizon. Right. Um, now we have taken this system and we've uh, expanded this to not only use monocular information, but also monocular inertial information. And here you're looking at the same system ported on a ground robot and um, our drone. They're viewing the scene. So, um, so the first version of this work, um, we called it the CVI SLAM, Collaborative Visual Initial SLAM. Um, where, of course, we have a visual inertial geometry front end. Um, and then using this inertial information, then we, we can have metric scale and gravity alignment. And of course, 
information in between the camera frames. But overall, this, this metric scale can also enable um, autonomy, right? But the architecture and the communication protocol is the same as, as we had before. And just to share with you some insights about why collaboration is important. It is intuitive, but it's also uh, cool to see this in action. So here you're looking at some results, root mean square errors, when considering um, uh, um, oh, data from the Europe data set when considering them individually, right? So um, the bigger the, uh, the number, the worse the error, of course, but when we consider them in collaboration with each other, so as if they've been captured um, as simultaneous, right? At the same time, then uh, the root mean square error for the same sequences goes down. So this is really uh, comes to show you that with multi-agent collaboration, the RMSC is improving not only after the mission, so not only after you um, uh, land and optimize over all of your map, but also during the mission, which is very important because during the mission, you have access to more than your own data. So you can be much more accurate than by uh, incorporating your own data alone. And uh, just to um, do some advertising here. So this is the latest version of our collaborative visual inertial slam. This is open sourced. Um, it's already on GitHub. Um, I promised Patrick I'm going to um, upload a page on, on our lab page to, to advertise this um, properly. But this is Covins. So here you're looking at it in action uh, with 12 agents in the loop on a simulated data set. Um, that they're doing exactly the same things that I said before. Only here um, you can benefit of all the fine tuning and of course modern twitches. So um, this system now works with um, Orb Slam 3. So the, the latest high performing Slam systems uh, and you can try to, to, to do collaboration with your own uh, work. Right, so multi-agent collaboration, what's next? Well, um, of course, so far, I have talked a lot about centralized um, architecture. So yes, we do some work in removing redundant data, but um, we also work a lot on uh, distributed collaboration, which I think is, is key to progressing this field further. Uh, yes, we do have the limitation of the um, uh, accessibility of our Wi-Fi range, but um, if I find a good way of communicating really from uh, one drone to the other, peer-to-peer -peer communication, then we can actually put our distributed um, architecture into action, um, which again, um, I think it's the, the, way, the way forward for, for scalability of uh, collaborative SLAM solutions. And we're also looking at enabling stronger collaboration. And here you can, yeah, looking at this scene, uh, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to talk about it in, in this recent video that Marco came up with. He presented it at DICRA. So here we're having a simulation of um, two drones. They're forming a virtual um, variable baseline stereo using one camera on board each drone. Bear in mind that the drones here are not colliding. We're just inflating their size uh, for visualization purposes. But ooh, the key thing here is that these drones are able to control their baseline according to the depth of the scene that they're looking at, right? So um, in order to so look at the, this example here, for example, where they're, they're going to navigate on top of this mountain, so they will need to change their baseline when um, they're, they're going closer and closer to the scene, basically. So the depth is becoming smaller, right? So you need a different baseline as uh, with respect to when you're experiencing the scene that is uh, further away from you. Right, so with these three challenges, we are aiming to teach robots to see and collaborate because we believe that these are key to um, pushing uh, robotic perception and what robotic autonomy can do today. And indeed, I did spend um, a lot of my uh, talk um, to show you videos on drones because we, um, at the Vision for Robotics Lab, we're aiming to develop their visual perception and intelligence that will enable them to collaboratively perform as a team. But the extension to other platforms is um, 
uh, well, straightforward might not be the right uh, the, the right adjective here, but um, uh, let's say that it is possible to extend to other platforms using the same principles. And indeed, here are some examples of uh, projects that we've been running to automate um, uh, train navigation, um, so robotics for search and rescue. So we have a team of uh, different types of robots uh, that are uh, uh, collaborating with each other to to map a disaster area or um, uh, work with Huawei to um, have a gaming application for multiple phones, multiple users that operate in the same area and visualizing the same um, uh, virtual area. And this is the last video I want to show you uh, because I think it's quite impressive. Uh, so this is um, a collaboration, not only um, from my lab, a collaboration with different labs here at ETH, um, architects, roboticists, mechanical engineers. Uh, so um, we are uh, building using an autonomous excavator that you see here. We are building a, a freestanding wall out of locally sourced stones. And uh, so here we are using onboard perception on the um, on the excavator itself. If you look closely, there's no driver in there. So this is um, a video that is captured over the course of a few days, and you can see in a little bit how um, we're going to come up with this uh, freestanding wall. Let me tell you that um, these stones and rubble they weigh about one ton each. Um, here you go. It's not the most beautiful wall you have seen, but I hope you. That is pretty um, impressive to see really how far uh, robotic perception can go and what it is that it can do. So I think this is just the beginning. And with this, I would like to um, thank my team. Uh, this is uh, an old photograph already, but of course, this is a team effort. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward for, uh, to your questions. Thank you so much, Margarita, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I thought it touched on so many interesting and important problems in robotic perception and SLAM, and it's very general, and the work you're doing is very exciting. I also loved all the videos, and we have a couple of questions. So uh, maybe we'll, there's someone who's raised their hand, so maybe we'll take that uh, first. Um, yes, so Peng, do you want to say your yeah. question? Okay, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. great. Uh, it's very impressive work. Yeah, yeah, just, uh, yeah, I, I'm going through the all videos and all your products, it's very impressive. Yeah, so I just want to wonder what, how are you doing the multi-agent corporate mapping, uh, corporate slam? I mean, if it's the same path, you're going to several times, several trajectories. So in that case, how can you do in the data association between two trajectories? Good question. Uh, there are many ways one can do that, but okay. um, the way that we do it is we take the, um, the modules of a traditional SLAM system. How would okay. you do data association? How would you do place recognition, right, for one robot? And then it's about streamlining the right inputs to that module. And it comes up with a place recognition amongst the keyframes that you, you give it, right? And it's doing data association amongst the keyframes that you give it. So um, the frame-to-frame -frame mapping is coming from the individual agents, so it's done already. But then when these uh, keyframes are, are streamed line, streamlined down to, to the server, then that server is taking these keyframes and it's trying to match one by one with respect to the database of images that it has. So in the same way that we're doing, um, uh, basically for, we're doing it for a single robot, then you can do it for multiple robots in this scheme of um, uh, collaborating in this centralized architecture. Okay, got it. Uh, just, uh, just one thing you wonder that is for the same area, maybe your, most, your, maybe your robot will be visiting here for multiple times. I mean, so mostly we using come here for two times, it's okay, we're doing the uh, data association for two trajectories, it doesn't matter. But what if there's a 10, tra uh, 10 robots going here uh, at a different time? Maybe the lighting is changing, maybe the viewpoint is changing. So in that case, if the data, data association sometimes is not that accurate, so which we are making a photograph, 
I'm with you on that. This is this is spot on, and yeah. uh, that's a a very nice topic, basically for someone to figure out: shall I trust the map that I have already, yeah. or shall I um, delete them? So, is this building something that has been demolished and is not there anymore, or mm -hmm. is my um, current perception of where I think I am distorted? So, it then also goes on about. Um, uh, long-term place recognition. So I would I would uh, look into that um, literature. And I think the next talk, Tim Barfoot, I think it's uh, he's talking a little bit about that. But there's a, a good body of work that looks up uh, looks into multi-session um, place recognition. It's a very cool, interesting. Cool, cool. Cool, cool, mm -hmm. cool. Actually, so actually, uh, so I'm Max. I'm from Basis Lab, I'm a product scientist. So actually, we are also doing the same thing. Yeah, so fantastic. Yeah, maybe later we can talk in more details. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Frank, for the question. Um, so the next, maybe now, since we're talking about place recognition, uh, there's a question when you were talking about the first part of your work on like how uh, these approaches uh, would be similar to like build roam in a day and how different are they? I guess you handle it later when you talk of bundle adjustment, but it would be good to maybe discuss that in context of place recognition. Can you can you repeat the question? Because I didn't really catch that. So the question is, is this similar to build Rome in a day? And I think this is referring to the first part of your work around place recognition. Building Rome in a day. So um, yeah, um, no, because I'm not sure what exactly we're referring to, but building Rome in a day is essentially um, capturing a lot of data Right. So this is what we call the, the full bundle adjustment, capturing a lot of data and then putting them in a cluster and coming up with a map and um, uh, the poses of where these images were, were captured from. Right. So this is the full offline problem. Now, what we do in the slum approaches that I have shown is mostly incremental. Right. So you build your map as you're estimating your your pose. So the the full global bundle adjustment well, when i talked right at the end when i was talking about uh, the different uh, ways of solving slam then the full global bundle adjustment corresponds to um rome in a day but overall the way that we use slam in the videos that i've shown is on an incremental online fashion so that can mean also access to fewer data right because sometimes we do select to have a more limited horizon time horizon uh, than the full global uh, optimization. But um, in general, it's the way forward if you want to have some autonomy on your robot in real time. Uh, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, agreed. Like, it's, uh, there's a real time constraint uh, definitely mm -hmm. with uh, slam problems to apply there. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a question when you were talking about the place recognition. Some of the images that you showed, it seemed like even, it was even hard for a human to match those to. Absolutely. Those Absolutely. Uh, I different. agree. Yes. Uh, so in, in that context, what, what do you think? Like how far can you push like these place recognitions across scene changes and where like maybe something else that would be useful yes. to do? Yes. I mean, um, a great question because uh, I do start by talk as uh, talking about the motivation that comes from nature and it does come from nature, right? Um, but I think place recognition is one example where current systems have uh, over sur surpassed what um, humans can do to some extent, right? Because you're looking at the query and you're looking at the return and you're like, really? These are from the same place? Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to this, to be honest. And I think it's good to use the motivation of, um, you know, the, the bio inspiration, if you'd like, as um, to kick off where one is going with one's discipline, but then don't stay limited to it. And uh, again, deep learning, it is the, the techniques are, are bio-inspired because um, this is how we learn, right? From example and uh, from looking at different cases, then we start judging about whether this place is the same as this place or uh, so on and so forth. But um, yeah, I, I don't know where we're going with this. Uh, it's exciting to, to see how far uh, we can push place recognition, but still have to say the bad side of this, as I said during the talk, is that um, such methods that work impressively on one particular specialized 
set of questions. They don't necessarily work as well. Well, they don't work well. Um, when you tweak even a little bit, for example, the, the viewpoint, right? And I'm not talking about zero to 45 degrees. I'm talking a small roll um, rotation and uh, such deep learning techniques would fail. And this is also, I would say, uh, quite a good difference between autonomous driving research and autonomous flying research. Because um, when you're training your network where, and, and the, the road is always on the bottom half and the sky is always on the top half, then to, to do that for your drone, then of course you're losing some of the accuracy because you don't have that assumption anymore. And of course you need different data. So distribution of data is different mm -hmm. from that. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, and then the next question is a more specific question that we have is, uh, how can you connect two different viewpoints taken from a different place or with a different orientation of a same scene in, uh, in SLAM, for example? Um, so the way we do this is, um, we're looking at a scene and instead of looking at the full pixels of the scene, we are reducing it into a set of features, right? A set of image patches. And so you detect the image patches of one viewpoint, the image patches of another viewpoint. And as long as these two patches um, correspond to each other visually and also structurally, right? So they have the same constellation in 3D, then we accept these to uh, correspond to the same place. And you can uh, also imagine this as a registration of one particular image to a 3D map and another viewpoint of the same area to that map. So that's how you can uh, start visualizing in your brain how, uh, how SLAM would do it. Uh, thanks. Uh, and the next question that we have is on for visual uh, SLAM tasks on drones. What computing platforms are you using to achieve, achieve these impressive results? Uh, another good question. So, um, of course, to have such impressive videos, we rely on a whole body of work that has been done in other disciplines, in sensing, in um, uh, boosting the battery lifetime, in having uh, great processors to, to put on our drones. And since the when I started working with drones, our drones were about 25,000 euros. Now you can have a drone for about, um, well, a full equipped drone for about mm, 5,000, but it really depends on, on what sensors you put on there. So um, right now we are using Intel NUCs. Uh, I think um, I just had a discussion with my student just before to um, uh, talk about this. It's uh, 11th uh, generation Intel NUCs, I think. Um, so whatever uh, the industry can provide us, we are taking it. And in some cases, we also have uh, GPUs on board, um, uh, very small ones, of course, they're not comparable at all to what you have on your uh, laptop or your um, autonomous car. Um, but this is a very fluid uh, uh, scene, if you'd like. Uh, and we are also adapting with respect to that scene. Uh Awesome. Uh, and um, maybe I have another quick one to ask you on your second mm -hmm. work, uh, which uh, was very exciting to me, like uh, using it for planning applications as well. The, so uh, I, I guess I want to get your general thoughts on like what, um, like was that an occupancy grid that was being built and then you were constructing scene reconstructions from there? And like, what, what did you, like, what would you say are like good, like scene representations that work across like SLAM as well as path planning, where you have to have free space and unknown space information, like you mentioned. That's a great PhD topic right there, Paloma. So what is a good scene representation for effective path planning? So to me, this is something that I would put someone to work on straight away. Um, yes, we are working with existing um, structures that they're out there, right? Um, voxel grid. <clears throat> to be able to augment this um, with whatever information we can encode that will be helpful for our, um, for our path planning. But um, it's not the final answer. I think there's, so we work with different representations and um, everyone has its pros and cons. I think it's good to keep experimenting. And uh, again, it's not something I can give a, a definite answer for. And I think it's, um, 
a very interesting question and and I think also at the same time it's cool that we're asking this because it means that we are at that stage where we are optimizing to that extent um, our algorithms uh, path planning and reconstruction right um, to really ask what makes good scene representations. Um, imagine that we started all the way from point clouds, right? Then uh, what makes a good 3D scene reconstruction? And now what makes good scene representations in order to avoid obstacles or even um, to um, manipulate objects? And that's even more important. And so I think um, your decision making in that sense goes hand in hand with, with the application that one has um, in mind and uh, that means basically the accuracy um, and uh, time requirements. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and definitely an open-ended question. Uh, mm -hmm. That's probably pretty task dependent what resolution of free space do you want to work exactly. with? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Cool, uh, awesome. And we're, on, we're over, a little bit over time, but I do, there are a couple of questions I'll just uh, summarize them and ask you, and that's on the last part of your work on uh, multi-agent collaboration. Uh, so I guess like this, this work that you showed was um, the central server that the maps were being computed to. Um, so what do you see are the challenges in moving from a central server to a peer-to-peer -peer fashion style um, map sharing? What are the bottlenecks in that? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the area where we are focused in, and I think is quite uh, interesting, is how do you make sure that you remain consistent and um, within your estimates? Because with a peer-to-peer -peer communication, with a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, sorry, this distributed fashion, you don't instantly have access to the whole map. So this is the beauty of the centralized approach, right? So you can say, I want to see where my drones are right now and what the map looks like. And you have it at an instant. Whereas in the distributed formation, then you have all the information, but not in a centralized location. So you have to unfold it. And um, there we are studying existing, um, uh, existing optimization um, strategies right with message passing and to, to see how you experience overlap between different agents make sure that you understand what is a good neighbor to talk to so this is on the um, on the conceptual side of things now on the practical side of things we have some obstacles that i haven't found a good way to overcome yet and this is really on the communication really how do you transmit information from one drone to the other effectively right so so far we are simulating this communication by um, a wi-fi network which is not distributed but it's very much centralized uh, so i think there's also there there's a way to go for the hardware and way to go for the software side as well definitely yeah, and this is like great first uh thing to uh yeah have a baseline on uh to compare okay awesome mm -hmm. uh i think um, uh that's all the questions and um uh, thank you so much uh, for coming out here. I think uh, your talk really highlighted some very important problems in SLAM that uh, we should be thinking right. about. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it was a pleasure having you here. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure to give the talk and to have all these questions. So have a good afternoon, everyone. See you. <laughs>